Have we just had the best week of stargazing this year? In case you've been living under a rock, here's a recap of what's just happened. We had the biggest aurora display of the year, the long-awaited appearance of comet Su Chin Shan Atlas as well as some very interesting visitors. We had yet another supermoon for the year 2024, and this week has been sandwiched in between two separate meteor showers, the Draconids and the Orionids. And to cap it all off, I've had the opportunity to try out two of the newest telescopes to be released, one of which simply isn't going to be released in the US or UK, despite it being phenomenal and costing less than £500. More on that in a moment. So let's take a deeper look at why this might have just been the best week of stargazing this year, and whether or not there could be a better one yet still to come. I'm Damon Scotting, and this is Astronomical. Okay, so picture this. It's a regular Thursday evening and you're playing football with your mates. The thought of stargazing is at the back of your mind right now. Maybe it will be clear later and you will have the opportunity to go outside and look up, but as of right now, you're not too fussed. So you go home and shower before someone from your football group puts in the group chat a picture of the aurora. It's go time. Funny enough, as far as astrophotography goes, this was a terrible night. It was just awful. As beautiful as it is, the aurora interferes with all of your images, which is a shame because I have two new scopes to test out. I've got the Ascar 71F available to buy worldwide for $599, and I've got the Skywatcher 125HAC unavailable to buy worldwide for roughly the same price. A couple of nights later, I got an opportunity to try them both out, and as I'm sure you will already be aware of, assuming you saw my last video, the Ascar 71F is an insanely capable little scope. These are some of the images that I have been capturing with it. So the bottom line is, I'm overwhelmingly impressed by the Ascar 71F. A quadruplet flat field refractor telescope for $599 is absolutely unheard of. The makers of this little scope have really knocked it out of the park. I can already see it becoming one of the most popular telescopes of the year. For more details, check out my full review or click the product link in the description below. Now, as for the anomaly, the scope that will not be sold in America for a whole host of reasons, the Skywatcher 125 HAC. This five inch scope has put the fun back into astrophotography. Don't get me wrong, I love spending nights taking long exposure images, but I miss the immersiveness of actual practical astronomy. The experience of looking through your eyepiece and exploring the night sky. Which might make you think, well, why on earth would you buy a telescope like this then? Because there's no option to insert an eyepiece as you will block out all of the incoming light. Well, it's because of its unique design that its focal ratio is at f2, which makes it one of the fastest telescopes in the world. What this means is, even with exposure lengths lasting one tenth of a second, you can still see so much in the night sky. This is a video I took as I was zipping in between different deep sky objects in our night nice sky, and the view you are seeing right now is about as lifelike as you can get. I have boosted the saturation a little bit to add a tiny bit more colour, but how insanely cool is this? You can explore the cosmos in real time. You can watch as the stars sparkle, as nebulae shimmer, and satellites whiz by. So much of astrophotography can feel abstract, but for the first time in forever, I feel truly immersed. And, better yet, I didn't have to break the bank to do so. I'll be going through all of the pros and cons of this telescope in an upcoming review, so make sure you're subscribed and have the bell turned on. It does have a few kinks, which I've found were very easy to work around. It's not possible to purchase from anywhere here in the UK or US, so instead I bought one from a store on AliExpress. I've attached a link in the description in case you are interested. Which then leads us to the night of the supermoon. Every time a supermoon comes around, I am bombarded with news articles and posts talking about how you can witness this super rare and spectacular event. The term supermoon isn't actually an official astronomical term, it simply refers to a point where the moon is within at least 90% of its closest position to us. And obviously, the closer it is, the bigger it looks. In terms of actual size difference, the supermoon's disk is 8% larger than its average size. The more noticeable aspect is its brightness. So it is a very cool event that actually does represent something relatively unique, but on average it occurs between 3-4 to four times a year, and generally in consecutive months. 
So as exciting as the term supermoon sounds, it's not actually that rare and didn't deserve this level of media hype. By the way, I imaged the moon with a Starfield 115mm triplet refractor telescope, and I was so impressed I decided to point this 4.5 inch refractor telescope at the gas giants Saturn and Jupiter. And how crazy is this? With 4.5 inches of aperture, a 5x Barlow lens, and an ASI 585MC camera, I was able to get these shots. The seeing on this night wasn't even that good, so it begs the question, how much better can it get? Well, I don't know about imaging the planets, but when it comes to the end of this week, the answer is a lot. This year's big comet is finally making its appearance into our evening skies. With each passing day, it moves into a high position in our night sky, but so too does its brightness decrease. I posted this video to TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube, and it became the first video this year to surpass 1 million views. On TikTok and Instagram, that is. I still haven't quite figured out what it is about YouTube that doesn't correlate to posting on Instagram and TikTok. I've also recently had a big enough break in the clouds to image the comet through the help of an interesting new mount that I also purchased from AliExpress. There's Yue 17 and the ever favorite ZWO FF80, which you may have seen in my previous videos. This comet is turning into a lovely treat to image, and if you're outside tonight, then be sure to have a peek at the comet as it moves very closely to the summer beehive star cluster, a potentially stunning composition shot that I am expecting to miss out on here in the middle of England, as the weather is, that's right, you guessed it, cloudy. But this just emphasizes more and more why the week before was arguably the best week of stargazing this year. Every week where there are clear skies has the potential to be one of the best weeks of stargazing. Events like the aurora are as unpredictable as they are remarkable. Rare sounding occurrences like a supermoon often make the headlines, sparking public interest in astronomy. And meteor showers like the Draconids and the Orionids are welcome spectacles even if they are very weak as far as meteor showers go. The thing is, I actually have a sneaky suspicion that the best week of stargazing is still yet to come. With the nights now getting longer, the opportunities for stargazing are multiplying fast. After Saturn and Neptune recently reached opposition, they will soon be joined by Jupiter and Uranus, with Mars not too far behind. Planetary season is entering into full bloom. One project that I'm very much looking forward to attempting is creating night-long time lapses for each of the planets as their respective moons dance around them. There's also plenty of familiar favourites now returning to our evening skies, such as the Great Orion Nebula and the dazzling Seven Sisters. And of course, we are quickly approaching one of the best meteor showers of the year, the Geminids. Now, I have no evidence to back this up other than a really good feeling, but I just have the sneakiest of suspicions we are going to get an auroral display the same night as this meteor shower peaks. And that really would make this year a truly legendary year for stargazing. So let's keep our fingers crossed and our hands warm as we head into the best part of the year. And quietly hope that what was the best week of stargazing this year still might transcend into the best year of stargazing this century. Thanks for watching, I'm Damon Scotting, and this was Astronomical.